You know, when I was uh, flying out here last week from China, actually from Shanghai, I kept thinking to myself, why the heck am I flying halfway across the world? But I have to say, this is like the coolest thing that I have ever been to. It's really, I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. And I'm sort of the nomadic architect, as my daughter Madison knows. I've traveled around Asia for 20 years. I've been through Japan and Korea, China, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, uh, India, and I've done work in all those markets. So what I wanted to share with you today is some of my sort of practical experiences, and maybe think about designing cities in a different way. So let's start with China. Uh, you guys know a little bit about China, but the changes in China are profound. From 2000 to 2010, 250 million people moved from farm areas to urban areas in China. And in China today, there is 700 million Chinese citizens living in urban areas. But I think what's even more profound, think about this, in the next 18 years or so, the next two decades, another 300 million people will move into urban areas in China. That's equivalent to the entire population of the United States, greater than that. China, by 2025, is going to build enough skyscrapers to fill 10 New York-sized cities by 2025. What does that really mean? That's almost 21 billion square feet. 21 billion square feet sounds like a lot of space, huh? That's equivalent to almost 8,300, 8,300 Empire State Buildings every single year. This is a shot of Hong Kong. So how do vertical cities impact sustainable design? So I'm going to use two examples. One is Houston. Houston is a low-rise, low-density city that has an average population density of about 3,500 people per square mile. Hong Kong, on the other hand, has a population density of almost 93,000 people per square mile. Houston uses 34 times the amount of land area and natural resources that Hong Kong does, and Hong Kong is 27 times more dense. And the reliance on the car in Houston and the CO2 emissions and the pollution that goes along with it is very different than Hong Kong, where mass transportation and walking is really the way that people get around. But I don't necessarily believe that just simply becoming more dense and going higher is necessarily a sustainable model, nor does it necessarily actually result in a great city. Let's look at some examples. This is Beijing. And you look at Beijing then, Beijing was a low-rise, high-density city. Look at it now. Essentially, it's high-rise, monolithic buildings that are really dictated by planning codes that require the buildings to be pulled apart because of shadow studies. So it really has changed the whole nature of the city. Or look at, look at Guangzhou. Look at the difference here. Look at the left-hand side and the density of the old village of Guangzhou, where you know, one could work and play and live, probably navigate the city by bike or walking, versus now. You, know, you can't get around Guangzhou, you can't get around Beijing without getting in a taxi or getting in a car. So I call this the birth of the mega suburb. It's really interesting, I was flying in uh, over Washington, D.C. And I saw all of the suburban area, very typical of the rest of the United States. And I kept thinking, these are single family, monolithic homes that require you to get in a car to go somewhere. This is exactly what's happening in China right now, right now only on a greater scale. Just take those single buildings and extract them and pull them up into high-rise buildings. And I call this the birth of the mega suburb. And this is happening all over, not just China, but in Asia in general. This is a shot of Beijing. This is one of the typical ring roads in Beijing. This is an 18-lane highway. How would you guys like to try to cross this? <laughs> you know, I've seen, I think there are actually two people or three people on the left-hand side there thinking about trying to navigate it. <laughs> but the only way to get across this is you've got to go through an overpass or an underpass. You know, Beijing in Actually, in China, in 2009, surpassed the U.S. in car sales. In 2010, 
Beijing added in one year alone one million cars to the road. One million cars. And right now there are five million registered cars in Beijing. So something's got to change. Something's definitely got to change. So I don't think it's the Houston model. It's not the U.S. suburban model. That doesn't work. And it's certainly not what's happening throughout Asia today. I think we need to look at a new par paradigm. Imagine breaking the boundaries between buildings and cities. Breaking the boundaries between cities and buildings. What makes a great city? Great places to live, great places to shop and to dine, viable businesses, preferably close to where you live, culture and entertainment, and of course, parks and open space. So what if you look at this horizontal city in a completely different way and you sort of extract it? Of course, transportation systems can't leave that out. So if you take a city, take all the great elements of a city, the texture, the fabric of a city, and you sort of extract it and you think about pulling it into the vertical plane, start thinking of cities three-dimensionally. And this is, I hate to call this a building, but this is a structure that I'm currently involved in, the chief architect. And this essentially is a vertical city. It's a structure that has housing, it's got hotels, it's got office space, it's got entertainment venues, it's got cultural venues, but even more importantly, it's got seven major parks, vertical parks, that are actually part of this, uh, part of this structure. This structure will house 35,000 people on any given day. 35,000 people. I think that's equivalent to 20% of the population of New London. <laughs> and 10 times the population of Mystic. So how do you navigate a building of this type? Well, like roads and like sidewalks, there's a vertical transportation system. This structure happens to be tied into all the major subways, all the major bus routes, which allow you to come from all parts of the city to the structure. There are 106 elevators in this structure, 37 escalators and more stairways than I can count. It will become, it is in fact, the most sustainable structure of this type in, this, in the world. It's built with the center core. The center core actually handles a vertical transportation uh, there are super columns. The columns for this are eight feet by 21 feet each. And there are eight of them that hold, on, that hold the structure up. And then it's surrounded by floor plates and where you see those light lines, each one of those light lines essentially is a vertical park. There's an inner skin, inner skin, and then there's an outer skin. The inner skin is, is cylindrical, the outer skin is triangular, and it twists. And the distance between the inner skin and the outer skin forms 17 story atrium spaces, 17-story atrium spaces, each one of which is a vertical park, which has all the amenities of the city. It's got museums, it's got you know, food amenities, virtually everything. The building was designed uh, with wind loads in mind. When you get to it, this building actually is, is 1,800 feet tall. So wind is a critical factor, and if you can reduce the wind loads, you can reduce the structural steel and the concrete required to actually put this building together, and that's a huge deal. This is about 30% less than a conventional office building in terms of structural steel. The building is going to generate its own power, not all of its own power, but a lot. It's got wind turbines in the top of the building. It's got cogeneration facilities in the base of the building. We actually looked at geothermal, but we really couldn't do geothermal here because the pad of the building to hold this is 21 feet thick to hold a building of the scale. And because of the pilings, we're not even down to river bed. We're down, actually, it's just a landfill area, so we couldn't do any ge geothermal. It's got a complete water harvesting system. We're going to take all the water that falls on the building, and actually a lot of the water that falls on the side of the building. It's completely recycled. Every single drop of water that comes off of the site is recycled over and over and over again until it's used. This is a video that gives you an idea of the scale 
as I said, it's about 125 stories tall, uh, which makes it about two or 300 feet taller than, say, Sears Tower. So it's one of the tall structures in the world. There are two other buildings adjacent to it. This is the wind turbines at the top of the building. And these are the sky lobbies and the sky parks. And these things are going to be completely landscaped. It's really an extraordinary structure. This gives you an idea of the scale of it. The buildings around it are 65 stories tall, 50 to 65 stories tall. So the scale of this particular building is immense. So vertical equals dense. Vertical equals lower land use, more efficient use of resources, better use of energy. And actually, vertical, more compact cities are worth more. Land values are higher, higher which is a great thing. But I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating doing a city of Shanghai Towers. I'm not. What I'm advocating is that we think about design rather, city planning and design, rather than being a horizontal effort, it's more of a vertical effort. And taking all these elements and creating a city where we have many, many, many buildings that are tied together. Many, many buildings that share different kinds of functions that are connected at multiple levels. Buildings that, in fact, are focused on people, not vehicles. So what I'm really advocating is really sort of breaking the stereotype and breaking the boundaries of city planning and really looking at city planning as more of architecture. Thank you. <laughs>